This morning, as, we, uh, as we're going to read here in a moment in Hebrews chapter 10, Paul is gonna, you're going to see that Paul is furthering his argument against work, uh, works-based salvation. He's, he's also, uh, you know, his argument against sinless perfection, meaning that you have to be perfect, that you cannot sin ever again. Uh, Jesus is, uh, that he's also, uh, you know, arguing against that Jesus' death is not enough to save us. Also, that the Lord will destroy his enemies. And then also why it is important to go to a good Bible-believing church. Amen? And so let's read Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 1. The Bible reads, For the law, having a shadow of things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because, because that the worshipers once purged should have no more uh, conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is impossible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Therefore, or wherefore, when he, uh, when he cometh in the, uh, into the world... He said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared, for, uh, prepared me. In burnt offerings and sins, uh, in sacrifice for sins, thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offering for sin Thou wouldest not, neither has uh, had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which uh, will we are, sacrifi- uh, are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth uh, daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which uh, can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting uh, till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he uh, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof where the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after uh, that he had said there, uh, before, there is a, uh, this is a, uh, the covenant that I will make with them. After, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquity, uh, iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath uh, uh, consecrated for us through, uh, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the, uh, the day approaching. For if we will, uh, willfully, or for if we sin willfully after that uh, we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a, a certain uh, fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which uh, shall devour the adversaries. Verse 28. He that des- uh, despised Moses' law died without mercy unto two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose he Shall he be uh, thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the uh, Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified and an unholy thing, 
and hath uh, done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know, for we know him, uh, him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord uh, shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, of, of the living God. But God uh, to remembrance, God called to, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you, uh, you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly, uh, whilst uh, ye, be, uh, ye were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly, uh, whilst ye, uh, whilst ye uh, be, uh, sorry, become, uh, became companions of them that were so used. For uh, ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoils of of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you uh, you have in heaven a be, uh, a better and enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which had a great recompense of reward. For uh, for you have a need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, he the, uh, he that uh, shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of, uh, not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this, uh, this morning. I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit. I ask that you would give me clarity of mind, clarity of speech, Lord. That, uh, Lord, that this morning as we hear your word, that you would give us ears to hear and that we not only just hear your word, but we would also do those things that we would be able to apply to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I said this morning, obviously Paul is furthering this argument against all those things you know, that I had mentioned, workspace salvation, sinless perfection, uh, Jesus' death not being enough to save us, that He's also, you know, he's also going to talk about the, that the Lord will destroy his enemies. The enemies are not going to get away with things that, that we think that they got away with. They're like, well, you know what? Uh, you know, so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that, so-and-so, whatever, and they got away with it. They may have got away with it you know, with man, but they ain't going to get away with it with the Lord. I'll tell you that right now. And so also, you know, the reason why it's important to go to a good Bible-believing church, and we'll see that here in a moment. So number one is this. Works don't work. All right? Works don't work. In the first uh, six verses that we, uh, we have, we see that the Apostle uh, Paul is making this argument that if, if you think that your works, you think your money, you think all these things are going to get you into heaven, they don't work. God doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your good works. He wants you. Okay? And so what we see in the, uh, in the first part, you know, uh, the fact of works or sacrifices can never save you. They can never make you perfect because that's the only way somebody can actually make it into heaven is if they were perfect. And nobody is perfect, right? We have it right on, the, you know, right on our wall, right outside the door. It says, you know, no perfect people allowed because nobody is perfect. But the thing is, is one of the, uh, what he talks about in verse 1, he says this. He says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, uh, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually made the comers thereunto perfect. In other words, Paul is saying, you know what? They thought that by bringing these sacrifices that they were going to be made perfect, and they were wrong every single time. Okay? But one of the things I want you to you know, realize is that he talks about that there's the shadow or an, an image. Well, here's the thing. A shadow or an image is what? Is a copy of a person, right? It's a copy of a person or a copy of an object. But it's not the real thing, correct? So if the shadow is there, we know that the object is there or the person is there, right? So in this, you know, what Paul's talking about, he's saying, you know what? The law is the shadow of the image, which is Jesus Christ. So here's the thing. If the law is the shadow of the image, which is Jesus Christ, then what? The Old Testament, which was given of the law, that means that Jesus Christ was in the Old Testament. Why? Because it was his shadow. Jesus Christ gave the law, 
which means, obviously, that he must have been alive in the Old Testament. The reason why I bring this up is because there are some denominations and some cults and everything else out there that teach that Jesus Christ did not begin to live or was not alive until, he, you know, until we see the New Testament, until we see Christmas Day when that baby's lying in a manger. Jesus Christ has always been, always is, and always ever will be. And so we see this, that he's been alive in the Old Testament. Why? His, the law is his shadow. He gave the law back in the Old Testament. That image is him. And here's the thing. He wanted sinless perfection. How do I know that? Why? Because he says he gave all the laws and said, keep these and we'll see how you do. In which he knew that we couldn't keep them. He knew that we couldn't. Not once did a single person keep the whole law. There's only one that did. That was Jesus Christ. But every single high priest, every single you know, a Jewish person, every single one of God's people never kept the law. They, never, they were never perfect because we can never be perfect. We can't keep the law, right? James, uh, James chapter 2, verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in, what, one point, is, he is guilty of all, right? And so you say, well, that doesn't seem fair. You know, you, just because I did this one thing, why should I get in trouble for the other thing? I didn't write the book, he did. And you know what? What we think is fair, God says no. He's like, I'm the one that's making the rules here. I'm the one that's going to tell you what it is, that if you break one, you've broken every single commandment. Why? Because you have pride, you have arrogance, and the fact that you say, I can keep all these by myself. This would go against you know, other, you know, other churches and everything else that say, you must be perfect. They're the ones saying that after you get saved, that you'll never sin again. I've heard, I've heard pastors, you know, preachers, once you're saved, you're never going to sin again. And you, How many of you know that's not true? It's not the fact that we want to do it. It's just the fact that, you know what, it happens. Why? Because this flesh wants to sin. What was made alive, what was born again at, at salvation? Your spirit was born again. Your flesh is weak. Your flesh will sin. Your flesh has been conditioned to sin. Why? Or how? Through your you know, actions and behaviors, and by the things that we see, you know, going on around us. So Jesus came, and he kept the law to show only one could keep the entirety of the whole law and not, and not sin once, as Jesus Christ. The law shadowed who was to come. That was grace through Jesus Christ. And it's only through Jesus Christ. The law was given for a reason, you know that? You say, well, then why should I read the Old Testament? The law was given for a reason. The knowledge of sin. If we, I mean, the Apostle Paul makes the, uh, you know, makes the argument in Romans. He says, you know what, I, I, you know, I would not have known the law, or I would not have known sin except for the law. I had told him to, or, you know, I had told him. The law was given to show us what sin is. The law was given to point us to Jesus Christ. Because of the fact that we have the law and everything else, the law is there to show us Jesus Christ, our need for him. And here's the thing. You can't have a shadow if you don't have light. And Jesus came and said, I am the light of the world. Right? So Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ coming into the world, is going to show that shadow. What? Because it's him. And also, here, here's the other part of it, is that Jesus is the image of God. He is the image of God. Why? Because for one thing, he is God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse, uh, verses 3 and 4, it says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, is, who is the God of this world? Satan, right? Hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So that's the reason why your friends don't necessarily agree with you if you're saved. It's because why? Their minds are blinded. It says, Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So when we go out, you know, you talk to somebody about the Lord, you ask that, you know, the God would remove, you know, that blindness that they would be able to see and understand those things. But the thing is right here, it says that Christ, who is the image of God, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it says, who is, and he, uh, he's speaking of Jesus Christ, it says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? 
Hebrews chapter, we go back to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the what? Express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by him, uh, himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Here's the thing. Why is that important? Why do you say, you know, what's the whole deal, you know, with Jesus being the image of God? The reason why it's, you know, so important is because we are made in his image. We are made in his image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says this. It says, so God created man in his what? Own image. In the image of God created he him, male and male. Female created he them. We are, created in, uh, we are created in his image. Why? Because God wants us to be like him. We are to reflect him in our life, right? Let's look at verses uh, 2 through 4. It says this. It says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged, should have no more conscience of sins, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is impossible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. You'll see this over and over again that the Apostle Paul keeps on talking about the blood of bulls and goats. Blood of, why? Because this is written to the Jewish people. This is written to the Hebrews. And that's the way that they got rid of sin or what they thought was getting rid of sin. They only covered sin. They said, you know what, we gotta, we got to sacrifice this animal. we got to sacrifice this one. And Paul, throughout the entire book of Hebrews, says, you know what, that's not sufficient. Jesus Christ is your sacrifice. And he did that once and for all. What the law should have caused was that there would be no more remembrance or no more conscience of sin. It should have taken away sin. It should have taken away, you know, those, you know, it should have taken it away. But because no one is able to be perfectly sinless, God's people in the Old Testament had to remember, had to remember all their sins yearly. Because think about it, they had to go back every single year. There was that sacrifice. They had to go back and say, you know what, I need to offer these animals for what I did this last year. Over and over again. And the thing was, is that was only to cover their sin. It was not to take away their sin. Why? Because it's an animal sacrifice. And what God wants, is it's not equal to the fact of a human sacrifice. That's why Jesus Christ is, our, you know, is the perfect sacrifice. Why? Because he's 100% God and a 100% man. That's why it is perfect. And he didn't sin once. Here's the thing. We sin daily and the blood of bulls and goats could never take away our sins because it is impossible for them to. We may uh, you know, still remember most of our sins, or at least a lot of them, but once you're saved, he remembers them no more. Aren't you glad about that? That once you're saved, that you go, uh, you go to him, he doesn't remember your sin anymore. Why? Because God, uh, Jesus Christ's blood covers it, takes it away, removes it, the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, he has taken our sin or our transgression from us. Verses 5 and 6. Let's read. It says, Wherefore, when, when he cometh into the world, he said, A, sac a sacrifice and offering thou, a wood, uh, thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Right, uh, well, Paul, for one thing, is quoting from Psalm chapter 40. He's, he's quoting from uh, Psalm chapter 40, specifically right around uh, verses 6, uh, 7, 8, where it says, Sacrifice and offering thou uh, dost not desire, mine, uh, mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. I delight to do thy will. Oh my God, uh, oh my God yea, thy law is within my heart. Ceremonial animal sacrifices could and would never take or remove our sin away from us. It could never take that. Why? But, uh, but only the blood of Jesus Christ could ever do that and ever forgive us and set us free from sin because the Lord takes no pleasure in sacrifices. And you'll say, well, I thought the Lord asked for sacrifices. 
kind of yes, you know, a yes and a no kind of a thing. But the thing is, is that God wants our obedience over our sacrifices. God wants our, uh, our obedience over sacrifices. And you say, well, why is that? Because people are more apt to give up something than they are to, uh, to actually, like, obey someone. Right? I've heard all kinds of plea deals and all, all, all kinds of different things when somebody says, well, I'll give up this, I'll give up that, I'll give up this. But the thing is, is that you ask them to obey or to do something and be obedient to that, it's like, I, I will fight you tooth and nail on that. People, you know, people don't want to obey what God has asked them to do. They'll give up everything. They'll give up money. They're like, here, God, here's a 20 and put it in the offering plate. That should make me good until next year. What are you doing when you do that? I, you know, growing up as a, uh, you know, as a Catholic and now, you know, obviously a former Catholic, that's what, you know, what happened all the time. I would see people going, you know what, this ought to take care of my, my sins for the rest of the year. Here's, here's a 20. You're doing the same thing as they did in the Old Testament. They just offered up animals. You're just offering up money. And by the way, the title of you know, my message this morning is Stop Trying to Be Old Testament Believers. Stop trying to be Old Testament believers. Because that's what he's talking about, is that the Jewish people that he's talking to are trying to keep doing those things. Why? They are believers, but they're still trying to appease those around them by doing the Old Testament sacrifices. Even though that they know that Jesus Christ uh, you know, paid for their sins once and for all, they don't want people to think anything different of them. They don't want, they don't want people to give them a hard time. They don't want to say, well, why don't you go over there and sacrifice you know, your bull for that sin? Jesus Christ took care of that. People don't want to speak up. Oftentimes, when you're being persecuted, you're presented with that, you know, with that issue, which is what? Am I going to speak up for my faith, or am, I, or am I going to keep my mouth shut? And that's what Paul is talking about here. He's saying, are you going to speak up for your faith or are you going to sit there and keep on uh, you know, doing those things just to appease them? Because the thing is, all you're doing is sending mixed signals. That's all you're doing is sending mixed signals. The Bible says this about sacrifices and obedience. Psalm 51, verse 16. This is a psalm of David. It says, for, for thou desirest not sacrifice, or else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. So God you know, doesn't care about your sacrifices that you give. He wants you. Let's read, uh, let's read Psalm chapter 40, verse 6 again. Sacrifice and offering thou, uh, thou did not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Samuel said this. He says, Hath the Lord as great... Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. God wants you in your obedience. He doesn't want you to just say, you know what, God, here, you know what, I'm going to appease you. I'm just going to give you a little bit of my time, that's whatever. I mean, there are people that I know that will come to church once a year, give in the offering, and like I said, and go. You'll never see them again. Until next year. I think I refer to these ones, you know, and maybe you might see them at Easter. These are ones that I call CEOs. They're uh, Christmas, Easter only Christians. But we somehow think that we're appeasing God or we're making them happy. We're like, oh, I showed up. I'm good. And they just throw their offering in there and they have no desire on wanting to change. And these people, you know, I use that term, you know, uh, Christmas, Easter only Christians because most likely they're probably not saved in the first place. Because the thing is that all they want to do is just come in here, show up, and go, okay, I'm good. But you know what? You're not fooling anybody by it. God says, you know what? I don't want your uh, sacrifice. I want you. Here's the thing. We are no longer under the Old Testament law as far as the ceremonial law. We don't need to go around, you know, you know you know, washing after every time that we come in you know, contact with something or every time we cut our finger or uh, any of those kind of things. Or the fact of that when we make a sacrifice, we don't have to take the blood of that animal and put it under our right earlobe or under our toe or anything else. Because you know what? If you read in the Leviticus where Hebrews, where he's appealing to, if you want to know what Paul keeps on talking about, why he keeps on talking about all these sacrifices, he's going back to Hebrew, or sorry, Leviticus because that's where he's coming from. He says, you know what? All that stuff in Leviticus, you know what? Christ fulfilled. 
All that ceremonial stuff that you saw in there, all that, all that washings and diverse washings and everything else, God has already taken care of that. That's the reason, for one thing, you're able to eat bacon this morning. You know that? There are people like, I've had, I've had former Jewish people who come up because they got saved, but they said, well, why is it that Christians eat bacon? Because Christ specifically dealt with that in the New Testament of saying, you know what, do not call, you know, do not call uh, unclean what I have called clean and referring to food. Now, obviously, you might want to watch the bacon or else you're going to have to go see the doctor a lot more often than you know, what you want to. But you know what, the Bible says that it is now clean. But when I say that, you know, that we're no longer the, under the Old Testament ceremonial law, we are under grace. We are under grace in the New Testament. That means that we don't have to worry about calendar dates or feasts or holy days or months, years, whatever. Why? Because God says to treat every day as a, a, as a regular day. It, there's no, like, feast or any special days that we have to, yes, do we have, like, Christmas and Easter and then we want to, but the thing is, is that, God's word, you know, doesn't say that we have to do that. Why? Because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. We don't have to do circumcision anymore. We don't have to, we don't have to worry about clothing that has mixed material. We can actually have poly, uh, a polycotton blend nowadays. We can actually have, you know, cotton with nylon or whatever they are, you know, all those different things. We can have those, you know, uh, nowadays. We can eat clean and unclean foods. The only reason why I would say that you might, well, might want to stay away from the unclean foods is because I think there's a reason for, you know, that God has it in there for that. You're not going to go to hell, but you, know, but you might, you know, visit Jesus a lot quicker. Because if you think about it, like, if, I know big down here, and this is something that somebody's going to go, well, how dare you tell me? Well, I'm going to tell you anyways, but it would be catfish. The Bible says not to eat a fish that has no scales, right? And like, Everybody's like, what, what are you talking about? I eat catfish, so don't, you know, I'm not coming a, you know, after you. The reason why, I mean, you think about it. What's a catfish? It's a scavenger. It's a garbage fish. It goes around and it eats all the stuff. So there's, a, there's truth to the fact of you are what you eat. I'm just saying. But I'm not saying that, I'm not going to come against you and be like, you know, smack the fish out of your hand as soon as you have it in your hand or the bacon or anything else. I'm just saying, you know what, you may want to watch what you're eating. Go get some bass or crappie anyways. I mean, you know, those are better anyways. But they don't serve them at restaurants. I don't understand that. He also talks about diverse washings, like ritual uncleanness. Every, every month, when it was that time of the month for women, what did they have to do? They had to go wash themselves, cleanse themselves, and then stay away from their husband for seven days. So ladies, in the Old Testament, you got a vacation for seven days. I'm not saying that time of the month is a vacation, but you, you probably got away from the kids and the you know, husband for you know, seven days. Now, you know, it, it no longer you know, is applicable. But Romans chapter 10, verse 4 says this. It says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, or everyone that is saved. Once you believe on the Lord... The Bible says you are saved. Number two is this, getting rid of ordinances and enemies. Getting rid of ordinances and enemies. In this portion, you know, I'm actually going to be talking about verses 7 through 24, but I'm not going to actually read all of those for the sake of time. But in verses 7 through 9, Paul again is reading from Psalm 40. In verse 9 it says that he, he taketh away the first, Right? In verse 9, yeah, it says, He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So, in, uh, so what is he referring to? He's taking away the first, what? The animal sacrifices, all those you know, ceremonial, sacrifice, uh, you know, ceremonial things that we had to do, because they have no value in taking away sins. Why? Because he abolished the ceremonial uh, laws and ordinances. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10 says, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. When's the time of Reformation? And it was not in the 1600s. The time of Reformation it was is when Jesus Christ came. And then uh, you know, the, his life, his death, burial, and resurrection, that's when the time of Refor a Reformation happened. It says that the second part of that, that the 
uh, that he may establish the second. The second is what? The New Testament, the new covenant that he gave, which is in Christ's blood. It, it was established by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's look at verses 11 and 12. And it says, every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. This is why it, it, it baffles me that there's so many people that believe that because you repent of your sins, that's going to get you uh, into heaven. That's a work that you have to do. It has nothing to do with your salvation. But they think that the more I repent, the more saved that I am. You can't get saved any more than what you already are. Because when Jesus Christ saved you, he saved you completely. He saved you to the uttermost. He can't save you anymore. You can't make him love you anymore. Why? Because he already does. Why? Because you're saved. Verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sin, or sorry, one sacrifice, four sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. What does this mean? Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, doing what? Nailing it to the cross. God has you know, told us that the things in which they used to do, those sacrifices, he did what? He blotted them out. He took them away. They were contrary. They were against us. Why? Because we could never keep the Old Testament law 100%. And you say, well, then why do we follow the Old Testament law? Because there's still moral law in the Old Testament that we need to follow. Right? You say, well, what's moral law? That is you know, the difference between right and wrong to your neighbor. It's the fact of, you know, the Bible talks about the fact that you, you know, that you, and there's some, I don't think I'm going to, you know, go into, you know, something, but there are some, there are some law, you know, some moral laws you go, yeah, that's probably good to keep. I mentioned one before, which is the fact of, you know, how many men in here think it's a great idea to be with your grandmother in a married way. The Old Testament says don't do that. Do you think it's a good thing that we keep that? That's what he's you know, referred to. He's referring uh, you know, to those things. Uh, he's, he's saying, you know what? Uh, you know, that all the other stuff, like the fish and all that kind of stuff, all the other you know, eating stuff, you know, that's done away with. But he's also talking about the fact, he says, you know what? Those are things that are against us. Why? Because if we offend in, uh, at one point, we are guilty of them all. How did he do it? He took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Verse 13, it says, Till his enemies be made his footstool. Till his enemies be made his footstool is referred to in multiple places in the Bible. It's referred to at least about eight times, including this time. And they were referring back to Psalm 110, verse 1, which says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. What does this mean? We are looking forward to the time when his enemies will be eradicated. They will be taken out. They'll be gone forever. You say, you know what? I want to have vengeance upon my enemies. I want to do it. I want to. You don't have to because I can guarantee that God's wrath is going to be far worse than anything you could ever do to him. Let God deal with them. As it says in verse 30, it says, for we know that, for we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Here's the thing. Don't, you know, don't worry about getting vengeance upon somebody else. Here's the hardest thing that you'll probably have to do when somebody has done you wrong, is to do what? Forgive them. You say, what well, you don't understand what they did. I may not understand it. But Christ called us to forgive. Do you know why? It's because the longer you hold on to that anger, the longer you hold on to that bitterness, the longer that you, you, know, you hold on to that vengeance, the more it destroys you and not the other person. That's why God wants us to, to forgive that person. I'm not saying forget it. I'm not saying go be buddy-buddy with that person. I'm not saying that you have to be best friends or anything else. I'm not saying that you even have to look at them when you see them at Walmart. All I'm saying is that the Word of God says that you are to forgive them and let God deal with them. Because you know what? Don't destroy yourself. 
just because you think it's going to hurt them. They don't care. Especially if they're not saved, they could care less what you think about them. Let the Lord deal with them. I can guarantee whatever the Lord does, it will be far worse than what you could ever do to them. Far worse. Don't let it eat, uh, you know, eat you up inside. Don't let it destroy you. Because you're going to take it out on people you love because you hate them. Just let it go. I know that's easier said than done, but that's something that we need to realize is that by us being mad at somebody or angry, it's not, it, they don't care. Let it go. Because here's the thing, as soon as you, you, know, you forgive them, you're going to notice probably like you know, a huge weight has been lifted from your shoulders. And the reason why is because all that anger and whatever, it just goes on. You're taking the burden that Jesus Christ is supposed to take upon you. The last time I checked, Jesus said, cast all your burden upon me. Because he can handle it. You can't. You say, well, I've been doing a good job up to this point. Well, talk to the people around you. You may be, you know, not too, uh, you know, too nice of a person to be around because of what somebody else did. And like I said, I'm not saying it's easy. I am not. But it has to happen if you want to be able to grow in the Lord, if you want to be able to do what God has you to do, if you want to be able to be the believer that God has you to be. Verse 14, it says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. It says, one offering. Who is that? It says, one offering he is Jesus Christ, right? That he has, what, perfected. For how long? Forever and ever. What does that mean? Forever and ever. His one offering means that we don't have to do continual animal sacrifices over and over again, which were, not ina- uh, which were inadequate in the first place. Because why? Because they only covered, they didn't take away sin. There were continual, uh, these continual uh, offerings from the Old Testament only did that. They only covered, they did not remove sin. I don't want, to, uh, want you to notice the latter uh, part of this is them that are sanctified. I want you to focus on that, you know, that three-letter word, are. I'm not talking like a pirate. I mean, say, I want you to you know, focus on that word, are. It says, are sanctified. I'm going to do a little English lesson for you. Say, well, man, I went to church. I was not wanting to go to school. Well, you know what? This is your little uh, you know, language lesson this morning. R is a present participle verb form, meaning what? It's being used in the, in the, in the past, present, and future meaning, meaning people who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ are perfected and are sanctified. What does that mean? When you got saved, not only are your past sins forgiven, but your present sins are forgiven and your future sins are forgiven. You say, well, pastor, how is that possible? Colossians says that that Christ has done what? That he has forgiven all of your sin. Well, he doesn't know what I'm going to do, but he did. He does know what uh, what you're going to do. You say, well, how is that possible? How can he forgive my, my future sins? We're so... And culture nowadays, we're so me-focused. Because think about it. If we were to think about when, when the Bible was written, when this is all written, when you know, Paul is preaching this, that was done what? 2,000 years ago. Are we not in the future? Didn't you know, his words say that he, uh, he has forgiven us all of our sins, that he paid the price, that he, he paid it all for us. So that means he already took care of our future sins. Why? Because if it was the present or the past ones, that would have been back in 33 AD, right around the time that he's all writing this. But he says, you know what? Your, all of your sins have been forgiven. Right now, that means that those believers are in the right standing with God right now. In past in the, oh, sorry, in the past, the present, and the future, and are holy now, and in the future, the shed blood of Jesus, you know, by them, uh, uh, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, the shed blood of Jesus Christ has forgiven them by doing what? By us putting our trust and our faith in Him alone for salvation, not in works, not in our own righteousness, but in Him only. The Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. So as soon as you say, well, I'm a good person, I'm 
you know, I'm better than so-and-so. What are you doing? You are ultimately saying, I am trusting in my righteousness. And we can never do that. Our righteousness, as the Bible says, is as filthy rags. When we get saved, we're trusting in him and his righteousness. We become clothed in his righteousness. Like I'm wearing this suit coat, I am clothed by the suit coat. Of course, it obviously would you know, take care of everything, but I am covered, and my sin has been forgiven and has been taken away. Amen? Let's look at verses 15 through 18. Where of the, of the Holy Ghost also is a witness for, uh, for after that he... Uh, wait, 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 sorry. I miss it. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Why would he do this? Well, let's continue reading. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's a great thing to read because all the wrongs, all the sins that we've ever done, what does he say? I'm not going to remember them anymore. That once you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, once you're saved, he says, I don't remember those things. I'm not going to remember. You say, well, then, Pastor, why should I ever ask for, for forgiveness after I get saved or a, you know, cleansing? Why? Well, for one thing, the Bible says that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. But the other thing is, is that it's no longer hanging over you. The devil can't use it. So once you ask Christ to forgive it, one of the things is, you realize, hey, you know what? I've been forgiven. I've confessed that to the Lord, and he can't hang it over my head. And if he tries to, I say, you know what? I've already confessed that. You know, I've already asked God for forgiveness. It's done away with. I'm good. Because he has, you know, here's the thing. Because he has done and paid for, uh, you know, paid for our sin completely, he doesn't remember any of our sins, and we don't need to make an offering for our sin. Why? Because he is the perfect sacrifice, and he has cleansed us, as stated earlier, uh, in, uh, from all unrighteousness. Verses 19 uh, through 20. I want us to, these are you know, certain parts that I want us to understand. Let's read uh, 19 through 24. It says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of uh, Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath uh, consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, uh, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful, that promise, verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And so the only way that the, the, high, pri you know, the high priest, the Old Testament high priest, could ever go into the holiest or the holy of, the ho uh, holy of holies, as it's called, they could not get in there unless they were perfect. And how was that? They brought an animal sacrifice. Why? Because that's what you know, they said they needed to do. They needed to bring that Old Testament sacrifice. Here's the thing. If they had thought something wrong, if they had done something wrong, if they just by chance, you know, I, don't, I don't know, I'll say breathed wrong, they were considered to be not perfect anymore. And you know what would happen if a, if a priest was not perfect? Well, let's just put it this way. There's a reason why they had a rope and they would put it around their ankle. And then there's also another reason why they had bells on the other one. Because if you heard them fall dead because of their sin, that means that they were not perfect, and you would have to drag them literally out of the Holy of Holies. That's what you would have to do. If a high priest was not you know, perfect, if he didn't follow what God's word had said in the Old Testament, that's what he would have to do. He would have to have that rope tied, and he would have to have bells on there, so that if they heard the bells all of a sudden stop ringing, that means that he all of a sudden died and dropped dead, and they had to drag him out. But here's the thing. We don't have to worry about that. Why? Because we can enter in by the blood of Jesus Christ. That veil that was there has been ripped in two. That happened you know, when Jesus he breathed his last and he said, it is finished. Because he is the only perfect high priest. And we have full blessed assurance that once we have placed our faith and trust in the finished work of the cross, that we are saved. That little word are, that three-letter word, are saved. 
Hold on to the profession that you made because he is faithful. Just because trials and tribulations come, hold on to your, uh, hold on to the, your professional faith. Why? Because life is, is and will and whatever will be rough. You will have trials. You will have tribulations. Hold fast to that profession that you made. Why? Because you're going to need it. You're going to need something to remind you what you did and that Jesus Christ is bigger than your problems, bigger than your issues, bigger than your trials and your tribulations, that Jesus is better than all of those things. Because you're saved, what you need to do is challenge and excite others to love one another uh, and uh, and do the things of God. Those are those, you know, the good works that we were talking about is the fact of that we are doing the things that the Lord would have us to do. Well, it's one thing. Talk to others about Jesus Christ. You say, well, pastor, stop beating that drum. And I say, you know what, once we start doing it, then maybe I'll stop. But I, I probably won't then at that point because then it will be a joy to you because we'll be doing those things that the Lord would have us. There's other things in, you know, the Bible to, uh, calls us to do, but I believe that's what, you know, the last thing that he said should be really important to us, that to go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel. Number three is this. Are you growing or is your growth stunted? Are you growing or is your faith or, your, uh, or is your growth stunted? Verse 25, it says, Not forsaking the assembling of, of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day is he approaching when Jesus Christ comes back? He's telling people, you know what? Because the Lord's coming back, you need to be growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything, you know what, here's the thing. Everything that we've talked about so far this morning doesn't help us at all if we continue to want to have a lone wolf faith. If we want to continue to be by ourselves saying, you know what, I am going to read the word of God by myself. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to show up for anything else. I'll show up when I want to, but I'm going to stay home. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to interpret the Bible the way I want to. That pastor can't tell me you know, what he's doing. That Sunday school teacher can't tell me. That deacon can't tell me how I should interpret the Word of God. There is a big problem with that, and we saw it. We saw you know, one of the reasons you know, that we should not forsake the assembly is because of the fact that if we begin that real process, for one thing, it's harder to get back into church, isn't it? Because everything in life will come at you and say, well, I can't make it. I can't do it. That's one thing. Another thing would be like in 2020 when the government said you can't go to church. And you'll sit at home, well, the government told me I can't go. So who are you listening to? Who did the Bible say that it was better to obey? Was it man or was it God? God says, you know, that we should get together and that we should, uh, and that we should do that often. Why? Proverbs uh, chapter 27, verse 17 says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of who? His friend. Not, your fr uh, not yourself, your friend. You're not here to be like, I'll get all warm and fuzzy feelings. You're here to help sharpen a friend. You're here to help, uh, you know, somebody else grow in the grace of... Well, I don't like that. I want to be sharpened. I want to come to church because then somebody else can come to you and sharpen you. It's a whole process that if you come, you can sharpen somebody else and then they can sharpen you and then you know what? Back and forth you go. And, it, and after a while, that double-edged sword you have is pretty lethal. We are here to sharpen each other. Like I said, one week you could sharpen someone. The next week someone sharpens you. Another week... Both of you are being sharpened. We cannot sit there and, and, and just listen to what, whoever says, you can't go to church, you can't do this, you can't, whatever. And, it, it, I mean, the only way you know, that I would say this, you know, it's fine to miss church, is when you're imprisoned and somebody is, is, holding, uh, is holding you uh, there and beating you and everything else. When you're being persecuted for your faith. And I can guarantee... In that moment, when you're being persecuted, when you're being beaten, when you have all those things coming against you, you're going to want to be at church. You're going to want to be sharpened. And the thing is, is that if you haven't been, that's where you're going to be wishing. But the thing is, is that if you've been going to church and you've been faithful and you've been going there, you're going to, you know what, you're going to be able to stand up against it and you say, you know what, God's word told me you know, about this. I'm ready. 
I'm ready for, you know, for whatever. I'm ready for eternity. And you say, well, that sounds like a death wish. Not, not a death wish. It's, it's a life wish. Because death is only but for a moment for the saint. Then you go on to eternal life. It's just but, but a moment. And how... Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't do that if you're not at church. You can't. You say, well, I, I know all kinds of... Yeah, you know how you applied it. And we are to study on our own. I'm not saying, you know, uh, well, pastor said, I don't have to study. I only got to come to church. No, you are to study it on your own. But we are to, you know, we are to share what we have studied with others and to also make sure that we're not believing every wind of doctrine out there or, or coming up with some sort of heresy because that's how cults, that's how other denominations, that's how all, all these other places have gotten to that place because somebody was by themselves and began to interpret it you know, for themselves. The Bible uh, speaks of this, you know, not to learn on your own. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation what you learn at home what you study at home bring to church make sure that you're biblical and not a heretic what's a heretic somebody that's going against god's word and i can guarantee you everyone that's here this morning does not want to be that person and yes like i said it is true that if that you don't need to go to church in order to be saved but you need to go to church in order to grow and to be sharp, uh, sharpened. You cannot forsake the body of Christ. You cannot do it. You should not do it. Verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, of, of the living God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. There are two possible interpretations of this. If you're not saved... I would suggest to you this, by reading that verse, you better get saved because you don't want to experience God's wrath. And if you are saved, what this means is the fact that you're backslidden. You say, what's a, what's a, what's a backslidden believer? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14, it says, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. In other words, you're believing you know, what you want to believe and not what the Bible says. You begin to do you know, your own thing saying, we just talked about it a little bit in Sunday school you know, this morning. We have a culture nowadays that says, if, we, if it feels good, then it's right. How many of you know just because something feel good, uh, feels good does not mean that it's always right? I'll tell you this, I like dessert. It feels good to eat dessert. But about an hour or two later, if I've had too much dessert, it don't feel good anymore. God, you know, here's the thing. God will use your backslidden heart to correct you. God will use your backslidden heart to correct you. He uses your backslidden state as a form of discipline. Just like he can use, you know, whether it's a saved person or a not saved person to discipline you, to get you back on the right track, he can use your backslidden heart to correct you and to try and get you back where you're supposed to be. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 19. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee or blame thee. In other words, when you backslide... You're going to know it. Why? Because it's going, to constantly keep on, it's going to constantly keep on showing you how far away that you are from God. I mean, he's right there, but you don't realize it because he'll never leave you nor forsake you. But your backslidden heart needs to change. It's along the lines of you having an issue with a family member. You say, you know what? I don't want to talk to them. Well, then you don't know what's going on in their life, right? You keep on you know, doing other things. You don't want to talk to them. You don't want to, you don't want to you know, show up to their house. You don't want to, you know, you don't want nothing to do with them. The backslidden Christian looks like that. They don't want to show up to uh, you know, God's house. They don't, want to, uh, they don't want to read his word because if they read his word, they're going to get convicted. Right? 
And uh, the fact is, is that the backslidden person wants to stay away from the things of God. He wants to stay away from you know, people go to, that go to church or anything else. Because why? Because he knows that it's going like, it's, it's to be like shame and blame being shined upon them. And people don't like that when that happens. And that's what God's, God's word will do. And as, you know what? If you're in that backslidden state, it's going to be hard for you to get out of that backslidden state. You know why? Pride. Because if you're proud enough to not trust in God, you're, you know, you're proud enough, you're going to sit there and you have to actually swallow your pride and do what? Tell God you're sorry and ask for forgiveness. That's the hardest thing, I think, you know, in life. Because I would rather go do the things of God. Or rather, there's times where I sat there and, you know, there's times where I knew I needed to go to my wife for something that I did wrong. And I sat there and I said, no, she needs to come to me first. It's her fault. Am I, am I the only one? Men? I mean, I know that, you know, nobody else, no other guy in this room would be like, no, I, my wife and I, our relationship, we're, we're you know, amazing. You know, everything goes together. You know, we just, we, you know, we love each other and we talk. I'm just admitting what happens to myself is the fact that there's times where I've sat there and, I've, and I knew that I did something wrong. I, was, I, I knew that I was wrong. I knew it, but I held on to that thing for dear life, I'll tell you that. I said, no, it's her fault because she started it. I mean, how old am I? Two. No. It's a hard thing to get out of it. Why? Because we have to admit for one thing that we're wrong and we have to ask for forgiveness. Hosea chapter 4, verse 16. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now think about that. If you have a backslidden heifer, what does that mean? They are stubborn, they're ornery, and they're untamed. If you know, if you know, if you try to to break an animal, especially one that doesn't want to be broken, you have a whole, you know, a hard, you know, tough time. And that's what he's referring to yourself. Is he saying, you know what? If you're backslidden, you're a backslidden heifer. I didn't say it; God's word did. But God can and will heal you and forgive you of your backsliding. Hosea chapter fourteen, verse four. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. You must ask for forgiveness and come up with a plan to stay away from whatever sin it is that's causing you in that condition. Once you ask God for forgiveness, you come back and you, you admit you're wrong and you do those things. Come up with a plan to stay away from what you were doing. Whatever was causing that. You would say, well, then I have to stay away from my spouse because they're the one. No, there's something else that caused that issue. It wasn't your spouse. It wasn't your kids. It was something that you're doing that is allowing it. It's very, because if you get into that you know, mindset of saying, it is my spouse's fault, it's my kids' fault, what are you doing? Just travel back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. It is not my fault. It is that woman that you gave me. It was her fault. She's the one who ate. No, it's not my fault. It's the devil's fault because he's the one. And we're doing the exact same thing over and over again. And finally, number four is this. Is it possible to fall back to, you know, to a point to where you're not saved? Let's look at verses 26 and 38 and 39. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth... There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And so if a... Let's just hypothetically talk about this. If a person's converted, they become a, a true Christian, and they... Go back to the fact of them not being, you know, if that were possible. The Bible right here is saying that it is impossible to be recovered or to be saved again. Why is that? Because the one we were trusting in to save us in the first place, we're saying that that person, Jesus Christ, doesn't have the power enough to keep us saved. So there's no more, 
there is literally no more sacrifice for it. Why? Because we're sitting there saying that Jesus Christ can't save somebody to the uttermost. That God can't do that. And what does he say in verse 39? He says, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. What is perdition? Well, let's you help it out. In 1 Thessalonians, he refers to the devil as the son of perdition. That is a person who is, you know, that is not saved, you know, that is a reprobate, that is not going to go back. He says, you know what? He says, but we are not of them that are of perdition. But he says, but of them what? That believe to the saving of the soul. He said previously that we are saved to the uttermost. So, you know, the fact is there is no way once we have truly believed on the Lord Jesus Christ to go back to where we're not saved. Let's go over to John chapter 10. I'm going to hammer this point until you say, fine, okay. John chapter 10, verse 28 and 29. Well, for one thing, let's, let's go back up to verse 27. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. Right? A sheep is not going to follow somebody else. It says, And I know them, and they follow me. 20, uh, verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall what? Perish, right? No. Never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Who is that speaking? It's not the Apostle Paul. It is Jesus Christ, the one in whom we say that has saved us. He says that no man is able to pluck them out of the Father's hand, that nobody can do it. Some people say, well, no man's able to do it, but I am. So you're saying that you're something different than a man, you know, as far as mankind, and that you have the strength to overpower God, to where you, you can all of a sudden, you know, like not be saved. You say, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna rip my myself out of the Father's hand. Who's bigger, God or you? Who's the Creator and who's the created? You're not gonna overpower the Creator. I'll tell you that right now. And the thing is, is that if you are truly saved, why would you want to go back? Why would you? If you could, why would you? But you can't. If we were to read all the Apostle Paul's letters up to this point, and then we read this one, we would know that he is not suggesting the fact that we can lose our salvation. But this is what he simply is saying. He's saying, if you could lose it, you would not be able to find it again. If you could lose your salvation, you wouldn't be able to find it again. Like those uh, car keys that sometimes that we lose. It's a good thing that you have some sort of beeper on that thing that, you know, uh, the way it beeps is the way you could find them. So I say this, this morning, if you're saved, remember that Jesus Christ is the perfect, sinless sacrifice that you are trusting in and not your good works. You do good works not to appease him, but because you love him, you want to do good works. Just like how you're supposed to be with your spouse, that you don't do something so you can be like, oh, I just need to get you know, them off my back. No, you do it because you love them. Do not use the grace that was given to you as a reason to sin, but rather use the grace given to you to live and influence others to be saved. Romans chapter 6. One way is, is to keep coming to church and not forsake the assembly of the believers. That's how you grow. That's how you sharpen one another, is by coming to church every week, every time the, you know, the, you know, the doors are open. People say, well, do I really have to come Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday? It used to not be that way. There are people that I know that every time the door is open, they're there. You don't have to question it. We're like, the doors are open, they'll be there. 
And that's how it used to be you know, for a long period of time. But I believe that as we're getting closer and closer you know, to Christ's return, you're going to begin to see a lot of people that you know, were faithful at one point, but all of a sudden, the Bible says that there's going to be a great falling away and that they're not going to want to go to church and they're going to start believing these lies that are out there. Don't be one of those people. This morning, if you're not saved, I would say this, don't wait for a certain day to get saved. I've heard people say, I don't want to get saved until so-and-so's birthday. I don't want to get saved until uh, Christmas because that would be an awesome time to get saved. I don't want to get saved until Easter because, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection. I want to be raised just like Jesus was. I've heard all kinds of things that say, I want to get, or I don't want to get saved until I have a family with a wife and kids and all that. Then I'll get saved. The Bible says that today is the day of your salvation. Why? Because we don't know how long that the Lord has given us upon this earth. We don't know. That's not a scare tactic. That's the truth. There are people that after I graduated high school, within a week were gone, had died. It's sad. I'm not saying that like, you know, just woo No, it's sad because they were pretty close friends. We don't know. I know of a little girl that's maybe a little bit younger than my daughter that has brain cancer. And they don't know how long she has to live. But thanks, you know, thanks be to you know, God that she is saved. She's not sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting for one special day. She says, you know, I'm going to do it now. Because here's the other thing is, you don't want to fall into the hand of an angry God. You don't want God's wrath if you're not saved. You don't want it. I don't want it and I am saved. I don't, I don't want any part of it. No person will ever face God's wrath that is saved. But if you're not saved, you will. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly